The virus is real. It's not a joke. It's real. In fact, as of yesterday, 86,022 people have been infected from the coronavirus. 2,700 people have died. Our world is in a panic. There's fear. Fear about the economy. Fear about what's going to happen, the stock market. And people are running around trying to figure out, what do we do? What do we do about this virus? What's interesting is just over 100 years ago, we did not even know viruses existed. It's just sicknesses. But in the last 100 years, there's been multiple viruses that have started, come and gone. And with every virus is a crisis. And in every crisis is an opportunity for the church to rise up, for leaders to emerge, for people to rise up and be the hands and feet of Jesus. But this coronavirus, it's interesting. It's if you were to look at what is this virus? Basically, it is a infectious agent, a microcosm agent that is now a threat to human beings. It started out spreading from bats to pigs and now to people. As of yesterday, China has now quarantined 26 quarantined. They can't leave. They're in a fence. They can't go anywhere. Just to put that in perspective, that's more people than the entire population of the state of Florida quarantined in China. They're now considering canceling the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. They're saying that this virus may now prohibit people from traveling. They're telling the athletes, go ahead and prepare like the Olympics are going to happen, but chances are we will cancel the Olympics. The only other time in modern Olympics where the Olympics were canceled also was in Tokyo during World War II. So the world is watching this virus, this small chemical genetic compound that goes into living organisms and begins to replicate itself. The goal of the virus is to steal all the resources of the host. The virus, once it gets inside a person, it begins to deplete them of energy, life, vitality, sucking it out of the host, spreading to another host. And now we're reminded again of the fragility of human life, that viruses can and do kill. As of now, only 100 cases have emerged in the United States, but it's in Italy, it's in Iraq, it's in China, it's in Iran, it's in Russia. And we're starting to talk about this small little microcosm agent that has become a world changer. Talk about the power of little things, that little things, little things like a virus can spread and spread and begin to suck the life out of everything. The Bible warns us about the little foxes that spoil the vine, the little sins, the little viruses of fear, of shame, of, of condemnation, the little doors we begin to open. But just like a little bit of sin can damage a life, a little bit of faith can set a world on fire. Jesus said faith as small as a mustard seed is like a virus. And I feel like this morning, this is a prophetic word for the church. That this virus has begun to spread across the world in every continent. People are trying to figure out how to stop it, what to do. They began to do a study in the last few weeks on who is the most susceptible, the most vulnerable to the virus. And they said it's the people who already have unhealed wounds, pre-existing heart conditions, the heart those who are already vulnerable in the heart are vulnerable to the virus. The Bible warns us to guard our hearts above all else, for out of the heart springs the issues of life. The virus becomes more effective when you're not guarding your heart, it's both spiritually and physically. The, the virus begins with just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little cough, a little fever, a little runny nose, and then it begins to spread. And the first thing it begins to attack is the breathing, the life. Whew. This is the goal, the tactic of the enemy. He wants to shut down our voice. He wants to stop us from breathing, to stop us from speaking, stop us from praising, stop us from worshiping. The enemy is in no hurry to destroy us destroy us if he can just shut us down. Just create an, an inactive church, 
an inactive Christian, someone who lives in isolation. I can't touch anyone. I can't talk to anyone. I can't be around anyone. I can't go to church. Can't go to the mall. Can't go to school. Can't witness to anyone. Can't lift my hands. Can't worship. Can't praise. I can't even talk. I'm losing my breath. And I came today to declare victory over the virus. I came today to declare that this virus has no victory. Not in our church, not in this nation, not in your family, not in your home. Today is a day to rise up with a spirit of faith in the midst of a virus of fear and say, I declare victory in my home. So if you got a Bible, go to Matthew 8, verse 26. Come on. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Let us leave changed. Let us leave encouraged. Let us leave transformed. Let us leave from a place of victory. God, that we are not victims. We are not a defeated generation. We are not a defeated culture. We are not a defeated church. No, we are victorious through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us leave today with greater faith than we came in with. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Jesus was with his disciples in the storm, and they were freaking out. They were terrified. And here Jesus is sleeping through this panic attack. He's sleeping through this fearful terror that has come in the middle of the night. They're out on the lake, and it's stormy, and the wind is blowing, and the disciples are freaking out. They're losing their minds. And they wake Jesus up, and they say, don't you even care? We're all going to die. We're all going to die. We're all dying. Now, the disciples had already decided in their minds that they were going to die because the victory is won in the mind first. The victory is won between the ears. So if you're already defeated in your head, if you're already worried, here, here's what a virus does. A virus exposes a lingering spirit that's already there. A virus exposes a worry that was already the pre-existing condition of fear and worry. It either it exposes faith or it exposes fear. For the disciples, they had not yet caught hold of faith. Just like fear is a virus, faith is a virus. Just like fear spreads, just like fear begins to come in contact, I came to sneeze some faith on you this morning. Achoo! I came to cough some faith in this house. I came to, to see if anyone wants to catch a spirit of faith this morning and get rid of a spirit of fear this morning. Come on, are y'all ready to have church today? So these disciples, they're sneezing fear all over each other. And when one man's afraid, another man gets afraid. And when one woman's afraid, another woman gets afraid. And then they start talking to each other. Did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? Oh, we shouldn't even give in the offering. We shouldn't even trust God. We shouldn't even go on mission church. Shouldn't even go on an outreach. Shouldn't even go to church. Shouldn't even do anything. We just need to sit in our homes. We need to bunker down. It's not a time to take ground. It's a time to bunker down. But I came to stir up a gossip train on faith. I came to start the telephone game of faith. It is tie time. It's harvest time in America. It's harvest time in the world. It's time to get your hopes up. It's time to get your faith up. It's time to stop letting the storm dictate how you feel. So the disciples are afraid. And they say, Jesus, don't you care? We're all dying. We're going to die. And Jesus responded in verse 26. Why are you afraid? The question throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Oh, ye of little faith. Why are you afraid. My question for you this morning is, what are you afraid of? Maybe you don't even care about the virus. Maybe you're not afraid of anything. Maybe you're afraid of certain things, afraid of spiders, afraid of heights, afraid of losing in front of people, afraid of losing friends, afraid of losing the approval of certain people, afraid of failing, afraid of, of, of stepping out and then things not working out, afraid that you're going to have a divorce, afraid that your kids aren't going to make it, afraid that you won't have kids ever, afraid that your dreams will never come to pass. The enemy loves to just spread a virus of fear. And so we're always thinking, oh, and I love what my wife said. She said, the enemy does not own the what if in our lives. Fear does not own the what if in our lives. Usually fear springs from what if scenarios. Fear is believing in something that hasn't happened yet. It's believing that you might catch the virus. It's believing that your kids might get in trouble. It's believing that your marriage may not make it. It's believing that you may not ever get that scholarship. Fear is believing in something that hasn't happened. What if? What if I walk on water and I sink? What if I launch out? What if I go on a mission trip and, and then think bad things happen? What if I try and I don't succeed? Like when I, when I first started out as pastor of Victory and started preaching, there was this intimidation that, that the enemy was trying to bring against me. And I would start walking towards the stage and all of a sudden this intimidation. You're too young. 
You're unqualified. You're not as good as your dad. You'll never be. And the enemy just began to just rain these thoughts of intimidation, of fear. Besides, who are you to preach on that? There's people in the room that could preach better on that than you. And you're too young to preach on that with so-and-so in the room. So-and-so in the room should intimidate you because so-and-so is really powerful. Have you ever been intimidated by a person or by a situation? A few of us in the room, the rest of y'all are just amazing. All right. But a few of us in this room have, have been intimidated. And I love how the Bible gives us a scripture verse for every fear. Every fear, God gives us a promise to combat every fear. So Paul was speaking to Timothy, and he said, Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Like Timothy did not write the book of Timothy. Paul wrote the book of Timothy because Timothy was struggling with fear, insecurity. Older members were intimidating him as a young pastor. And Paul said, Timothy, stop that. And he says in verse 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 1, you have not been given a spirit of fear. You have not been given a spirit of intimidation. God has given you what? Power. Say it with me. Power, love, and a, a sound mind. Where is this fear coming from? Who gave you this fear? Who's stirring this fear up? And you need to tell that fear to go back to where it came from. Tell that fear to go back to hell. Tell that panic to go back to, tell that anxiety to go back to hell where it came from. God didn't give you that. God gave you power, love, and a sound mind. So what's stirring fear in your life? I love the song that Hillsong wrote, Not Today. Tell the devil no, not today. And in that song, the, the author of the song wrote these words, fear is just a liar that's running out of breath. Fear is just a liar that is running out of breath. Fear will rob you. Fear is a virus. It will suck the energy out of your life. It will suck the resources. It goes from host to host. The virus only attacks living organisms. It doesn't attack something that's dead. So if you're feeling attacked, that means something good. You're alive. You have power to get rid of that virus. You have power to overcome that virus. You have the cure over that virus. And today, I want to give you seven ways to have victory over the virus. I had eight ways, but I thought seven is God's number, so I'm going to bring it down to seven. <laughs> All right, are you ready, church? Number one, how to have victory over the virus, you've got to be alert to the virus. Be alert. I didn't say be afraid. I said be alert. It's one thing to be prepared. It's another thing to be panicking. Like, I'm all about preparation. Please hear me real quick. Because people are like, ah, oh, Paul doesn't even care about preparing. No, no, no. I absolutely do. But I do not believe that God has called us to prepare out of panic. I do not believe God has called us into a frenzy of terror and freaking out. And what if we die? And having this language of defeat, like, oh, everyone's dying. It's doomsday. Our best days are behind us. No, they are not. My best days are right in front of me. And I have victory in Jesus Christ, my Lord. I don't have victory because of a personality. I don't have victory because of a president. I don't have victory because of a government or because of a medical cure that scientists come up with. I have victory because to live is Christ and to die is gain. Oh, where death is your sting. Oh, where grave is your victory. The devil is defeated. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Fear has no hold. So yes, be alert, but don't be afraid. So Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be alert, be alert. You didn't, you didn't come to hear Paul's ideas. You came to hear God's ideas. So God tells us in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil. Notice that he doesn't say your enemy, the coronavirus. He doesn't say your enemy, Ebola. Your enemy, the ex-wife. Your enemy, the ex-boyfriend. Your enemy, the stepmother. Your enemy, the mother-in-law. No, no, no. Your enemy is not a person. Your enemy is not the president. Your enemy is not a government. Your enemy is not China or North Korea or Kim Jong-un. No, no, no. Your enemy is the devil. There is something darker than the virus at play here. There's something deeper. There's something much more mature that you're not seeing beneath the surface. The enemy is using a relationship to deplete you of energy, and you're convinced the relationship is the enemy. No, no, no. The enemy is something much darker. It's important that we understand this opponent that we're facing. When I was in high school, I played football and basketball, and we would sit in the locker room, and we would study film on the other teams. So Coach Wakely, he'd pull us in. He'd say, okay, we're playing, we're playing Webster this weekend, and, and we've got to... We gotta study them. Or we're playing Edison, or we're playing Jinx here. And so we would sit in the locker room and we would begin to study the film. We'd sit there, we'd have notes. Come on, how many of y'all are taking notes this morning in church? Yeah, note takers are history makers. 
Go ahead and wave your Bible up in the air like you truly do care, or your phone Bible, or your phone notes. There you go. Come on. A bunch of history makers in the church today. All right, so, so what we would do is we'd sit in the locker room, and we would say, okay, this guy's the shooter. This is the big man. Oh, and the shooter, he loves to shoot from the outside. He's, he's not a guy that drives in. So we would study the tactics because the enemy is not stupid. The enemy is strategic. The enemy is, in, he, he is so strategic. He will find what it is that he can get into your life. And this is why if you're going to win against the virus, you got to understand how the virus wins. And some people, they're, <laughs> they're trying to figure out their own way to beat the virus. I was reading articles this week and one that was really funny. I wasn't going to share. It's not in my notes. But now that I've gone out on this limb, I might as well share it. So usually when I do this, I regret it. <laughs> I'm like, just edit that out of TV. But I think I'm going to keep this one in. It's funny. I'm going for it here. So, so I read on this article, millions of people are, have stopped drinking Corona beer. <laughs> hey, whatever it takes to get people to stop drinking the alcohol. But they're, they're convinced. They're like, I'm alert. Those Coronas are spreading. <laughs> so what I'm saying is we got to understand who the opponent is, who the enemy is. And, and listen, the enemy loves to find ways to get into your life, to stir up fear, to get you not to be sober-minded, right? So he may use alcohol. He may use a drug. He may use a guy, a girl. He may use a sin, a habit. He may use things to get into your life. And you wonder, where's my energy going? Where's my life? Where's my mind? Where am I at? Why am I not uh, effective and productive? And why am I so constantly feeling uh, overwhelmed and oppressed? This is what happened to the Israelites in 1 Samuel 14. In verse 1, it says, Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let us get up and go into the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Now, this was pre-Goliath, pre-King David being anointed. This was during King Saul's reign. King Saul started off good, but he caught a virus. He caught a virus of the fear of man. He was more interested in impressing people with his Instagram profile than he was with obeying God. And so he was, he was in this virus of fear. And because he was in this virus of fear, King Saul was camped out in Migron under a tree with a migraine. And he had 600 men. No, no, no joke. He had headaches. Saul had crazy headaches, migraines. He just he couldn't think clear. He was constantly overwhelmed. He was jealous. He was discouraged. He was afraid. He was insecure. And as the leader goes, so goes the nation. And so the entire nation was camped out there, and the Philistines had sucked the energy out of the Israelites. So here King Saul had led the Israelites into a depression. All their weapons had been stolen. The Philistines had encircled around them, and there was no way for the Israelites to win. But there was a son, and I believe that Jonathan could have been the future king of Israel. I really do. But because of his father's oppression over him, he never did rise to the potential that was on his life. And so Jonathan, one day, the son of Saul, who would later become the best friend to David, Jonathan rose up and he said, we can't win sitting here. We cannot beat this virus by sitting in fear. There's no way we're going to have the victory if we just sit here. So Jonathan tells his armor bearer in verse 6, he says, let's get up and let's go to that garrison of those uncircumcised Philistines for perhaps the Lord will work for us. Remember how I said fear doesn't own the what if in your lives? You have a choice of the what-if scenarios you're going to throw out, the fear-filled what-if scenarios, but you also have a choice to, to, to throw out faith-filled what-if scenarios. Like you could say, what if I do this, but it doesn't work out? You can also say, what if when I step out, God steps up? That's what Jonathan was saying. What if perhaps God will work on our behalf if we just step out? Maybe it's not us waiting on God. Maybe it's God waiting on us. Maybe God's waiting on us to activate our faith. So Jonathan says, we can't sit in this depression. We can't sit in this fear. We can't sit in this panic. We can't sit with this virus. We've got to get up. And we've got to attack this thing head on. And so what he does is he gets his armor bearer. His armor bearer says, I'm with you, heart and soul. And they attack. And men, when they stepped out, God multiplied their impact, gave them the victory. And this is why it's so important to understand, I've got to be alert to the virus. But I've also got to recognize that Jesus is my victory over the virus, that I am not overwhelmed by my opponent. I have everything I need to attack this virus. And a virus creates a crisis in which leaders emerge. This is where Jonathan would rise up. God's looking for people who fear him more than they fear the virus. 
which leads me to number two. Defeat the virus with a greater virus. To have victory over the virus, you've got to defeat the virus with a greater virus. How many of y'all remember when Ebola was a huge thing in the news? Ebola. And people were like, don't say it, don't say it, Ebola. You know, and there was this fear, Ebola, Ebola. It was spreading. We're not talking about it anymore. Why? Because they found the cure to it. They found the cure to Ebola in Ebola. You say, that doesn't make sense. They were trying everything except the virus. The way to kill a virus is with the virus. When you get bit by a poisonous snake, the anti-venom that cures you from that snake bite is actually venom that's taken from the snake that bit you. The thing that tried to kill you will also be the thing that brings the healing in your life. What the enemy meant for evil, God is going to turn around for your good. Come on, I'm preaching this morning if you're tracking with me. The cure to Ebola is with Ebola. And I am sure we will discover this with this virus. That the cure is found within it. The anti-venom is found within it. So look in the scriptures, Numbers 21 verse 7 the Israelites were being bit by poisonous snakes. And left and right, they were being bit by poisonous snakes. And, and they come to Moses and they say, we've sinned. We've spoken against God and we've spoken against you. And now we need you to pray to God that he will take these serpents away from us because people were dying. And so Moses prayed for the people. Now watch, in verse eight, God speaks to Moses. Are you okay that I'm just giving you a lot of scripture today? All right, because um, I don't think you came to hear my opinions. You came to hear God's word. So the Lord says to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. In other words, I want you to take the thing that bit the people, and I want you to lift it up on a pole. And everyone who looks at the thing that bit them, everyone who looks at the very thing that was sent to destroy them, they will live. And sure enough, in verse 9, when Moses lifted up that snake on a pole, when he lifted up that snake on a pole, those people, when they looked at it, they were healed. They instantly were set free from the poison that was in their veins. So then Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus was a church-going guy. He was a religious man. And so he's talking to Jesus. He's interested in religion, but he's not interested in relationship. He's more in love with the law than he is with love. And so Jesus starts talking to him. And in verse 14 of John chapter 3, he says, just as Moses... This would ring a bell in Nicodemus's ears because Nicodemus was a law guy and he studied the Torah. So he knew who Moses was. He knew all about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And uh, so Jesus says, just like Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. All right, so Nicodemus is thinking about that. He says, yeah, 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 the, the story of the serpent. And then Jesus would go on to say in that same chapter, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not die by the virus, but have everlasting life. For the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. So Jesus is saying, the Son of Man must be lifted up just like the serpent was lifted up. Jesus was comparing himself to a snake, which is very interesting. I'm not a snake fan at all. But Jesus is saying, just like the snake that was meant to kill the people actually brought the healing to the people, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, and everyone who looks to him will live. Well, Paul puts this, he kind of ties it all together for us. Paul the Apostle, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to tie it up here, verse 21. Paul says, for he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become. Here's a better way to say it. He made him who had no virus to take on our virus so that through him we would become the healed righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You cannot cure the virus with your own good deeds. The only cure is when you place that dirty, ugly sin on a perfect, spotless sacrifice. Sacrifice. The Son of God went to the cross and He took your lust and He took your pride and He took your sexual sin and He took your dirty secrets and He took your lies and He took your fear and He took your guilt and He took your condemnation and He took your shame and He took your gossip and He took your slander and He took your betrayal and your bitterness and He who had no sin took on the virus for you because that was the only way that you would be healed. The way we defeat the virus is with a greater virus. When we look to Jesus and we recognize he went to the cross for me, that's where our righteousness comes from. It's putting our hope in him. It's interesting that in the Bible there was things that tried to attack the Israelites. And many times they would run. In Gideon's time, they were running. 
In Joshua's time, they were afraid until Joshua took a stand. In Moses' time, they were afraid. Jonathan's time, they were afraid. There's this one moment in 1 Samuel 17 where Goliath shows up, and he starts shouting at the Israelites. They all start running because in their minds, they're thinking, victory is in the caves. Victory is hiding behind the rocks. Victory is moving to another country. Victory is isolating ourselves from the virus until David shows up, and he looks that virus in the eyes, and he says, you uncircumcised Philistine. (laughs) I love the Bible. It's so unapologetic. And he says, you come at me. You come at me. You speak these lies to my people, and they run, but I'm not running. I'm not hiding. You hear me, Goliath? I'm not afraid of you. See, if you don't talk to your giants, your giants will talk to you. If you don't talk to your mountains, your mountains will scare you, and they will send you to a place of hiding. But David looked that virus right in the eyes. He realized his victory was not running from the virus. It was going straight at the virus. He realized that the way to attack it, the way we attack fear is with fear. When fear defeats fear, you say, no, 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 faith defeats fear. Right, right. But faith is fear. If you think about it, faith is having a greater reverence for God than you do for the virus. And reverence is fear, the fear of the Lord. If you were to look on Google, what is fear of God? You would find hoodies and tennis shoes and backpacks or whatever, you know, fear of God. It's like a brand. It's a clothing brand. How many of y'all got some fear of God stuff? All right. And, uh, but, but the real, the fear of God, the guy who created that's a Christian. And he pulled it from the scriptures because the Bible teaches us that the fear of God is the cure against the fear of everything else. If you're going to defeat the fear of the virus and the fear of man and the fear of money and the fear of the economy and the fear of the stock market and the fear of your supervisor and the fear of losing your job and the fear of losing your kids and the fear of losing your wife, you're going to have to fight those fears with a greater fear. You're going to have to have a greater reverence for God's presence, God's power, God's word, God's principles than you do in the reverence for the coronavirus. Proverbs 10, 27 says, the fear of the Lord prolongs your days. But the years of the wicked will be shortened. Proverbs 19, verse 23 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life. When I say fear God, I'm not saying you're afraid of God. I'm saying you reverence God more than you reverence the stuff that you're afraid of. You have a greater respect, you have a greater reverence for God. He who has the fear of the Lord will abide in God's satisfaction. He will not be touched by harm or by trouble. The fear of the Lord is like a force field against the troubles, against the difficulties. The fear of the Lord protects us. The fear of the Lord delivers us. The spirit of fear debilitates, but the fear of the Lord empowers. The spirit of fear brings death, but the fear of the Lord brings life. Psalm 33 verse 18 says, behold, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who put their hope in his love. So I'm like perfect love cast out fear, but it does not cast out the fear of God because the fear of God is believing in his love more than you believe in the thing that's trying to attack you. So the fear of God is having such a great reverence for his love in your life that it's pushing out all the fear of the future, the fear of your finances, the fear of failure, the fear of what people think, the fear of kids. And so Psalm 33, 19 says, this fear of God will deliver you. It will deliver you from death. It will keep you alive in the midst of the famine. So we defeat the virus with a greater virus, which leads me to my third point. Plead the blood. Plead the blood. Come on, how many of y'all know you wouldn't be here today if it was not for the blood of Jesus on Calvary? It's time to draw a bloodline around your house, around your marriage. Can I tell you something in this church? We've got a bloodline around this campus. The enemy has no authority in this house. When you step into this place, you step into an atmosphere of victory. You step into an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit rules and reigns. No matter, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 says, I heard a loud voice from heaven. I want the keys to come out saying, salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God is here. And the power of the Messiah has come for the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. You know what the enemy loves to do? He just loves to accuse you. Just loves to get in your face and accuse you. Tim and Daniel, can I use y'all for a second? Can I get your help? I need someone to be the good guy and someone to be the bad guy. Who wants to, who wants to play that part? 
Okay, all right, all right. Tim, you're the good guy. But Daniel, I want you to be the accuser. This is what the enemy does. I want you to just point your finger and just walk around me, just circle me. The enemy loves to do this every day. You loser, you failed. You can't raise those kids. You'll never be good enough. You're not a good enough husband. You're not a good enough dad. You're not good. The enemy loves to just condemn you. You're gonna catch the virus. You should be afraid. You should be afraid for your life. You should be afraid for your kids. You should be afraid. You can't even sleep tonight. I'm not gonna let you sleep tonight. This is what the accuser does. He wants to rob you of your sleep. He wants to rob you of your peace. You shouldn't even go to church today. Yeah, you need to be afraid. Do you see what happened on the news? You can't even go. Don't, don't go to the connect group. Don't tell anyone anything. You let anyone too close. Oh, they're gonna betray you. Betray you just like your friends did. Betray you just like that last family did. Yeah, and so the enemy just robs you of life. So you're just living here. Just get closer. But Revelation 12, verse 11, says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. When I plead the blood of Jesus, the blood stands between me and the accuser. So I want the accuser to just try to circle me. And everywhere he goes, I want the blood to stand between me and the accuser. The accuser is coming at me. But the blood is stopping it. So what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing. When I have the blood of Jesus, I want you to just keep coming at me. The accuser never stops. He never stops. He never stops. Even when you go to church, he's going to come on Monday, try to knock on your door. Do you see what else just happened about the coronavirus? Do you hear about this? And, and it's nothing new. His tricks have been going on since Genesis chapter 2. He's been tricking people. He's been sneaking into the garden. He's been trying to rob people of peace, rob people of faith, rob people of joy, rob people of living with a sound mind, just trying to condemn you and scare you and get you just feeling oppressed. Wants you to live like, like hell on earth all the time. That's what the enemy wants. But when the blood of Jesus stands there, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. The blood of Jesus defends me against the accusations of the enemy. It's time to plead the blood of Jesus over your family, over your life, over your business, over your nation, over this church. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. If you've ever watched a good movie that involves the court and the lawyer and the judge and the attorney, you know, those, these movies where the lawyer is speaking to the judge, well, he did this, and where was he on the night of that? And you know that all the witnesses say this, 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 and this. What do you plead? In that moment, you don't say, oh, I plead what I've done. I plead what all the righteous things I've done. No, no, no. I plead the blood of Jesus. He went to the cross. He paid for my sins. He paid for my sickness. He paid for my issues. He paid for my fear. The blood of Jesus speaks louder than the blood of the virus. The blood of Jesus speaks louder than the fear, speaks louder than the anxiety, speaks louder than the guilt, the condemnation, the shame, the inadequacy, the insecurity. I'm so thankful. How many are thankful for the blood of Jesus? Come on, don't praise God for me. Praise God for you. Go ahead and just thank him for the blood. Thank him for the blood. We're going to take communion right now. And if you don't have your communion elements, the ushers will pass them out. Just raise your hand and tell them you need one if you didn't get one when you came in. Ushers, if you could step out and just look for hands that are raised and make sure you bring it to those men and women, boys and girls. There's something powerful about communion. By the way, when Jesus took communion with his disciples, it was the Last Supper. And this week, the church calendar began Lent, leading up towards Easter, reflecting on what Jesus has done for us. And that night, Jesus began to share this new covenant with his disciples. But Jesus was taking this supper with them, and and this is called Passover. The first Passover supper happened with Moses. 
God used Moses to deliver the Israelites out of slavery, out of bondage, out from Pharaoh's hand. Pharaoh was oppressing them. He was attacking them. He was whipping them. He was keeping them in bondage. And God sent Moses to deliver them. But, but Pharaoh's heart got hardened. And there was nine plagues. There was ten plagues. And um, the first nine plagues, they weren't too bad. I mean, they were pretty rough. But the tenth plague was the worst. It was the virus, the spirit of death, the angel of death. And God told Moses, Moses, I want you to tell every child of God, every Israelite, to take a spotless lamb. And you sacrifice that spotless lamb. And you take the blood from that spotless lamb. And I want you to put it on the doorpost plead the blood over every house, every marriage that has the blood, every family that has the blood, everyone who's covered by the blood, they will be protected from the virus. They'll be protected from the spirit of death. And so that night was the first Passover meal where Moses said, go into your home, eat a supper with your family and put the blood on the doorpost. When the angel of death came through, it did not touch, did not touch the children of God. Jesus came in the New Testament with a better covenant, a covenant not just for Israelites born uh, by blood, but a covenant for all tribes, all nations, all tongues. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Jesus said, this blood covers you. This blood speaks louder than your sin, speaks louder than your problems, speaks louder than the virus. This blood, the blood of Jesus. And Paul says, do not take communion in an unholy manner. So the way that we take communion in a holy manner is by putting our faith, our hope in Jesus Christ, repenting of sin. First John chapter one says, anyone who confesses their sins to the Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive them. So if you would, just bow your heads and close your eyes across this room. Before we take communion, if you're here today and you need to repent, you need to just say, God, forgive me. His forgiveness is here. If you're here today and you say, man, I'm just... I'm not right with God right now. My heart, my mind, there's things in my life that just aren't right. And I need to repent. If that's you, just raise your hand all over this room. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. From the front to the back. Yeah, before we take communion, just say, God, I need you. God, I need you. God, I repent. I ask for your mercy, your grace. Let's pray this all together across this room. If it's your first time to pray this, we're going to welcome you to the family of God. If, you, if you're praying this today as a recommitment prayer, we're going to welcome you back home. But just say this with me. Say, Jesus, I repent of sin and I receive your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross. You rose from the grave. And I confess you today as my Lord and Savior. I'm all yours in Jesus' name. That night, Jesus took the bread and he broke it with his disciples. And he said, take this bread and eat it. And as you do, remember what I have done for you. Let's remember what Jesus did for us today. Then he took the cup, he said, this is the new covenant that I have made with you. My blood is poured out for you on the cross. Your sins will be wiped away. As far as the east is from the west, he remembers your sins no more. Sickness and disease, he's healed on the cross. Death has no hold. The grave has no hold. Victory is ours through Jesus Christ. The, before we take this drink, Jesus didn't promise us that we won't die. He promised us that we would have victory over death. Death has no sting. The grave has no sting. The devil has no sting. So today as we drink this, we remember Jesus is our Lord, our Savior. He is our deliverer. He is El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, our banner of victory. Today, let's drink and remember the victory we have in Jesus. Come on, how many are thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross? You can pass these cups down the row. Our ushers are going to receive it. I'm only on point three. I got to get to point number four. This gets better and better. Number four, speak out the promises of God through prayer and worship. Speak out the promises of God. If you're going to talk, you might as well talk faith. If you're going to talk, you might as well talk hope, talk victory. Talk yourself into God's promises. 
Pray out the word of God. Speak out the word of God. My God is greater. I love just stirring up, just worship in my house. I'll put on songs. I love listening to the Bethel album, the Victory album. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I love just stirring that up. And then I'll play, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to the Lord. Man, I love listening to the Chris Tomlin song. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. I love just singing out the scriptures over my life. Why? Because there's power. The enemy wants to keep you muzzled enemy wants to muzzle your voice, wants to shut you up. Don't talk, don't talk, don't talk. And when I'm talking through this, it's, it's muffled. You can't even, you can barely even hear me. The enemy wants to keep you back here. But to break off that power over the enemy, you've got to begin to declare the promises of God. And I want to speak some over you this morning. Psalm 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers under His wings. I will take refuge. His truth will be my shield and my buckler. I will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor by the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at my right hand, but it will not come near your house. Only with your eyes will you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. In their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample under your foot because he has set his love upon me therefore I will deliver him I will set him on high because he knows my name he shall call upon me and I will answer him I will be with Paul in trouble I will be with Sarah I will deliver John I will honor Caleb I will honor you with long life I satisfy you Sharon I will show you my salvation come on if you believe in the promises of God give him some praise this morning Come on, Daniel. Come on, Jay. Come on, Kevin. Come on. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Never stop, never stop giving praise to God. Don't let the virus shut down your voice. Don't let the virus shut down your voice. All right, number five, to get victory over the virus, you've got to remember there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's power. There's power in his name. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted Jesus, and he's given him the name that is above every name, the name that's above cancer, the name that's above divorce, the name that's above abuse, the name that's above addictions, the name that's above coronavirus. And at that name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I remember I was in another country and I was with my friend Josh and Jill and we had gotten away from our team where we were at in Dominican and we had kind of just been talking and walking and we got miles away from where we once were and it was getting darker about 7 p.m. when all of a sudden these two robbers came up and attacked us and um, they start shouting at us, dinero, dinero, stupid americano, dinero. And I was like, no. 
They said, give us your backpack. You know, they're like shouting at us. And, and my backpack had all our passports, had our money, had my laptop. And uh, I was thinking, man, if I give them my backpack, we can't get out of the country. And so I'm like, Josh, we got to fight these guys. So Josh and I, we start punching them in the face. They start punching us back. Then we're on a cliff. We're on a cliff, 40 feet cliff j- drop with like sharp rocks at the bottom, the ocean out there. And, and, and they start trying to throw me off the cliff. So I start trying to throw them off the cliff. And I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, this is, ba- this is like a Batman movie. This is bad. Because our stats, when we get back home, we're going to say like a thousand salvations, a hundred healings, one guy off the cliff. And I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to report this, but here we are. And I'm trying to fight for my life and they're attacking us. And Jill Stafford is with me and, and she's like screaming, screaming. And finally, she just shouts, Jesus. And when she shouted Jesus with that power and authority, these two robbers backed up. Their eyes got huge and they started pointing. And I'm looking behind me like, what do they see? What do they see? And they took off running. I was like, that's right. We're going to call the police on you. You get out of here. Thanks for Christo. Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, and I'm like shouting. They took off running. Why? Because the Bible says demons tremble at the name of Jesus. There's power in Jesus. There's power. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. God did not give us the great commission so that we would bunker down and go, ah, we can't go out there. Like as a kid, I grew up watching my parents go into countries that everyone told them, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't, no, don't go there. Not that place. Don't go there. And my dad and mom were like, we're going. And they weren't stupid. They were alert, but they were not living in fear. So they took precautions, but man, they went right into Sierra Leone during the time when nobody was going to Sierra Leone. They went right into Russia when hardly any Americans would even step foot in Russia. They went right into India, in places, into Pakistan. You go, ah, just that's too adventurous for me. That's too much Indiana Jones for me. Come on, God did not call us to live in a spirit of fear. The enemy wants a church to be inactive. So to combat the inactive church, we've got to rise up with number six right here. Choose faith at every turn. Years ago, there was this movie that came out and in the movie, there was a virus. And it was almost like Hollywood was trying to preach without preaching. But in, in, the, in the virus, everyone who contacted it went into isolation, went into fear mode. And, and so they just kind of bunkered down and they just stopped moving. The only people that survived were the ones who were moving. And, and one of the guys in the movie says, movement is life. When you stop moving, you start dying. Movement is life. And I remember just, just hearing that and thinking, that's, that's, the, that's what God is calling the church to do. We've got to move by faith. We cannot, this is not a time to bunker down. This is not a time to live in fear. Guys, we are living in the greatest harvest in the world right now. This is a time to give big. This is a time to live big. This is a time to dream big. This is a time to serve big. This is a time to live with faith. Choose faith. When the offering bucket passes by, choose faith. When it's time to get in a connect group, choose faith. When it's time to serve, when it's time to go on a mission trip, choose faith. You might as well choose faith. You only get one life to live. You might as well live a life of faith. You might as well get out of your comfort zone. You might as well stop making excuses and living with fear and bunkering down. It's time to choose faith. It's time to get your hopes up. It's time to believe for greater. It's time to believe that God is with you. He is for you. He's on your side. He lives inside you. You have the victory. Come on, you got the victory. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, Paul says, we do not walk by sight. We walk by faith. We walk by faith. We walk by faith. We walk by faith. Every time I've chosen faith, I've never been disappointed. I guarantee it. Every time you choose faith, you will not be disappointed. At every turn, choose faith. When you're tempted to choose fear, choose faith. When you're tempted to choose worry, choose faith. When you're tempted to talk defeat, choose faith. I'm going to give you a chance to activate your faith right now in church. We're going to give our offering this weekend. At the end of your row, there's offering envelopes. And I want to encourage you, choose faith. Choose faith right here. Choose faith. Choose faith. Choose faith. Let faith spread like a virus this morning. I want to sneeze some faith on you. Listen, 
as you take the envelope, I want you to write down prayer requests, praise reports. This is missions weekend, and we're going to sow a seed into a country right now that has been affected pretty badly by a flood. In Brazil, in Sao Paulo, right after they had the send, a revival uh, where thousands of people gave their hearts to Christ, thousands of people gathered and rallied. That next day, this was just two weeks ago, um, the next day, a massive flood hit Sao Paulo. And one of our partnering missionaries that we're working with, in fact, we're going there for spring break, they lost everything. You could see in these pictures, all their chairs ruined. They don't have flood insurance. They don't have any insurance there. No one, like, no one's helping them. They lost their entire children's church rooms. All their kids' classes, their sound system completely destroyed. And the pastor, he, he reached out to us. He said, listen, I'm not giving up. I'm not losing hope. I'm going to reach my city. I'm going to reach these people in Brazil. And I would appreciate it if you guys just pray about what you can send. So this weekend, I'm asking you to give above your tithe because we're going to help this church out. How many think it's a good idea to help people that are in need? How many have been helped when you were in need? If you weren't, so is he today. Let's, let's help some, someone who's in need. Let's help a community that could, that could use this offering, this fragrant offering of generosity from our church that we can send to them in March. You could text to give, 28950. Text any amount, victory plus the amount. And what we're doing is we're activating our faith muscles. I want to encourage you to write down things you're believing God for in your envelope. Ashley and I, we're always dreaming and, and challenging each other Let's believe God for that. Let's pray for that. Let's sow a seed towards that. Let's believe that God's going to help us with that. Some of you in this room, you're believing for scholarship money. You're believing to have a, a transportation, a car. You're believing to pay off a car. You're believing for a house. You're believing to sell a house. You're believing uh, uh, for a job, a better job, a promotion. And I'm telling you, don't lose your faith. Don't put your faith on the shelf. It's time to pull it back out, back out today. It's time to spread that faith like a virus in your soul. To start stirring up your faith again. Choose faith at every turn. This last week, I was sitting with our core leaders, and um, about six of us, we were in a room. We meet every week for a couple hours, just praying over you as a church, praying over what God's asking us to do, checking up on the school, the Dream Center, the camp, the college, all the areas. And I said, guys, I want us to take just 30 minutes to prophesy over victory. Just prophesy. What are you, what are you feeling in your hearts? Oh, my word. If you could have heard some, there is amazing things on the verge here at Victory. One of the guys started prophesying over about what's, what's going to happen at the Tulsa Dream Center. And, man, I just got lit. I was like, what? Yes. Yes. We have eye has not seen, ear has not heard, mind has not perceived what God has in store for his church. The best days of this house of our dream center, the Bible college, the Christian school, our youth group, our children's church, our mission trips, our missionaries, the best days are truly in front of us. So we start prophesying and we're just speaking by faith. The Bible says, speak by faith, speak by faith. When Ezekiel prophesied, God said, Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? Ezekiel says, I don't know. Why are you asking me? You're the only one who knows that. God said, no, no, no. I'm asking you to talk to those dead dry bones. I'm asking you to speak life to the nation of Israel. So as Ezekiel began to prophesy, the bones began to rattle. The valley, something happened in the valley. The victory was in the valley. There's things in your life that look dead, that look impossible. God's saying, I'm challenging you to speak to that thing. I'm challenging you to pray over that thing. And so we began to prophesy and just pray. And Mark said something. He said, I'm believing that our church is going to lead 250,000 people to Jesus this year. Outside of evangelistic crusades. I said, yes, I'm believing for that too. And uh, we began to just mathematically figure out how would that happen. If every member in our church led three people to Christ every month, what is that? Every 10 days, lead someone to Christ. Every 10 days, sow a seed. If you don't lead them to Christ, at least sow a seed of the gospel message, sharing the gospel with them, praying with them. If you led three people to Christ, at the end of the year, you will have led 30 plus people to Jesus. Well, I love the idea of compounding. Uh, uh, when, when, when you start getting a collective group of people, it begins to compound. And if all of us did that, we would well exceed 250,000 people that we could lead to Christ this year, that we could bring from the, the throes of hell, that we could deliver out of the, the hands of darkness and bring them into light. And so this leads me to my seventh point here. You ready for the final point today? We're going to end with some worship. The seventh point. I need some help. Daniel, will you go grab that thing over there behind the, behind the booth? I'm tired of looking at the virus. Let's switch this up. Let's change this. Let's just look at this now. This is, what we're, this is where we're at today. This is where we're at. My last point is plant the flag 
of victory. Plant the flag of victory. And we got a victory flag here today. Doesn't this look pretty? There's something beautiful about the flag of victory. Now, in the old days, when the Roman Empire would take over new territory, when they would go into towns that wasn't theirs yet, when they would take it over, they would put their insignia on that town. It was like their brand. They were saying, this is now part of the Roman Empire. This is now part of what we own as the Roman Empire. But what we understand as Christians, when we go into territory and we begin to share the gospel, when we begin to take authority and dominion over our houses, over our hearts, over our marriages, over the children in our schools and our universities, what we're doing is we're planting a flag of victory. We're saying, not in my house. We're gonna plant a flag of hope. We're gonna spread victory like it's a virus. Did anybody see when OU beat the Ohio State? And Baker Mayfield ran out to that 50 yard line and he waved that OU flag and he waved it and he waved it and he waved it and he he stuck that flag in the center of the field what was he saying he was saying you lost we won we got the victory some of you need to go into your house Some of you need to go into your university. You need to go into your school. You need to go into your master bedroom. You need to go where the enemy has been attacking your business. You need to go to your bank. <laughs> you need to go to the area where you have felt so defeated, so discouraged, and you need to wave that in the enemy's face. And you need to say, not today, Satan. It's time to plant the flag of victory. I want you to stand to your feet today because we're gonna end by planting this flag. I'm getting ready to plant a flag in our church that the best yet, yeah, 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 the best is yet to come. That we have victory in our finances, victory in our health, victory in marriages, victory in homes, victory in houses, victory in every area. We're gonna plant a flag in North Tulsa. We're gonna plant a flag in East Tulsa. We're gonna plant a flag in South Tulsa. We're gonna plant a flag in Manford. We're gonna plant a flag in downtown. Why? Because the, the nation is stirred with fear. And a defeated world needs a victorious church. A defeated community needs a victorious church. It's time for the church. And I want to challenge some of you guys. You need to get a flag. We're going to print these flags. And I want to encourage you to just get one once we will probably get them out here in the next month. I had two business guys come up to me last night. They said, man, I need to plant a victory flag in my business. The enemy's just been trying to attack us. I need to plant a flag of hope, a flag of victory to tell the devil, not today. I'm pleading the blood of Jesus. I'm drawing a bloodline of victory over my house, over our company, over our finances, that the best is yet to come, that we're gonna advance the gospel. I wanna encourage you today that you would this week look for opportunities to walk in victory, that you would mobilize your faith, lead someone to Christ this week. God wants to use you. The greatest revival will not happen inside the walls of the church. It will happen in the marketplace. It will happen through businesswomen, businessmen. It will happen in universities. It will happen in public places. It will happen in Walmarts. It will happen in quick church. The revival that God wants to bring requires a church that is committed to the Great Commission, to wave that flag over Brazil, to wave that flag over the United States of America, to wave that flag over Iraq, over Iran, over Russia, over China, over North Korea, over every tribe, every tongue, to say Jesus Christ is Lord. And the devil is defeated, and we have victory over the virus. So here's what I want you to do. If this message is stirring something in you, I want you to leave your seat and come join me at this altar because we're going we're gonna to end today with a song of hope, an anthem of victory. If that's you, I want you to just leave your seat. If God's stirring you today to get out of a spirit of fear, to get out of a spirit of worry, to get into a spirit of hope, if God's stirring you today to lift up a banner of victory over your campus, over your family, over your finances, over your business, over your dad's business, over whatever thing the enemy has been trying to attack you in, today is a day of hope. Dom, I want you to lead us in this song. And as he leads us, let's just begin to sing this out today. Let's just sing it with hope. I raise a hallelujah. Yeah. yeah. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief. I raise
I was at ORU, I was part of a group called the Maybe Maniacs. And we got loud and wild and crazy. Trey, come up here. And we would paint ourselves, we would run around, we would cheer for the ORU Eagles. But our favorite part was the final minute of the game. We're in the final minute. We're in the final minute. Heaven is on its feet. In the final minute of the game, one guy had the privilege to hold the flag. And what he would do in the final minute is he did a victory lap around the Maybe Center. And that victory lap was signaling, it's time to finish strong. It's time to give it all we got. Come on, this is the victory lap, church. 2020 is gonna be a year that the church rises up like never before. On a day, on an ordinary day, a church did an extraordinary thing. Trey, are you ready to run? I'm ready. I want you to circle this whole house. And when you do, we're gonna cheer. We're gonna sing, we're gonna cheer. And when you see the, the flag coming around your area, I want you to get a prophetic vision that God is circling you in victory. God is circling, he is surrounding you with songs of deliverance. He's surrounding you with an anthem of victory. Go ahead, Trey, come on, let's go.
gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. feel like the Holy Spirit's moving right now. I understand that we've gone past our, our normal time. If, if you gotta leave, I totally get it. But I just feel like the Holy Spirit's not done yet. And so just, Holy Spirit, do what you wanna do. Speak. Lord, deposit dreams. Deposit strategies. Lord, deposit the faith that's necessary for people to speak to mountains and see them moved. Deposit the faith that's needed for people to rise up and take those God ideas, those huge ideas that you've stirred in their hearts and activate those faith muscles. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that from the church would rise an anthem, that the church would be responsible, God, to bring an anthem of hope, an anthem of medicine, an anthem of grace, an anthem of victory, God, to those who feel overwhelmed, to those who feel defeated. I pray that in our city we would see a mass revival of people getting saved, people getting healed, people getting restored, people getting back into church, people getting back into community. I pray, God, that right now across the world we plead the blood of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over sons and daughters, over mothers and fathers. And God, we speak to this virus to come to an end. And no weapon formed against your church shall prosper. And I thank you, God, that you will keep those whose minds are stayed on you in perfect peace. God, that we would have peace. We would have a sound mind. We would move with power and with love, God, and a sound mind. I want to end today. I just feel in my heart we need to end today with a shout of victory. We've already prayed the sinner's prayer, the, the, the believer's prayer together. We've already confessed Jesus as Lord of our life. But I just feel like today, as a final act of this message, that we should just shout victory together. And I think when we shout it, we should shout victory in Jesus, because that's where our victory is at. So on the count of three, church, this will be our final part here. Let's shout this together. One, two, three.